first you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi, Hardeep. Is now a good time for us to plan that computer programming lesson we've been assigned? Hey, Don. I was just thinking about that, actually. Yes, let's get it out of the way now, shall we? I've got the instructions here. So, it says, Design a 45-minute lesson for a class of 16 teenagers where they learn how to write a simple computer program in BASIC. Now, I know, of course, that BASIC is the computer language people used to use back in the 1980s when they wrote programs on microcomputers, but I'm not sure I feel very comfortable teaching anyone about it. Well, I did a bit of research yesterday and found out quite a few things, so I think we'll be okay. Great. So, what do you have in mind? Well, I think we should presume that none of the kids will know anything about BASIC, so why don't we start with a short multiple-choice quiz? It could focus on things like what BASIC is, what the letters stand for, when people used it, things like that. That sounds good. I guess it shouldn't take long. Just the first five minutes of the lesson, something like that. I don't think we should make the students do it on their own, though. That'd make it too much like a test. Shall we let them do it in two so they can discuss their choices? Yes, good idea. Then we'll go through the answers with them as a whole group. Good. What next? Well, I've had an idea for the program they could write. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I think the key thing is, though, that before they actually sit at their computers, and I think we should presume that they're doing this lesson in a computer room, they make a flow chart of what they want the program to do. That's usually the best way to start writing a program. This flow chart will show all the different stages of the computer program, right? Exactly. It's probably best if the teacher stands at the board and everyone works on that together. Yes, otherwise they'll all come up with different flow charts and it'll get confusing. Precisely. I imagine making the flow chart will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Then they use that to write their computer program. Well, actually, I think there's a stage before that. You see, the flowchart will be in English. They're going to need to be taught a few basic commands so they can write their computer program. Hmm, now I'm getting out of my depth. What kind of thing would that be? Well, for example, when you want text to appear on the screen, the command is PRINT in capital letters followed by the text you want to appear in double inverted commas. Oh, yes. I think I've seen that before. Right. So they'll need to be taught five or six commands before they use them to write their program. Okay. So how shall we do that? With the teacher talking to the whole class again? Well, we could, but it might be more fun to make it more like a competition, where there are a few teams competing against each other. Each team has maybe four or five people in it, and they have to do some kind of matching task. You know, they match the command print with to make text appear on the screen, something like that. That sounds good. Teenagers love competing with each other. Exactly. And then, for the final part of the lesson, they use their flowchart and the commands they've learned to produce the program. Let's presume, shall we, that there are eight computers in the room, so that's two students for each computer. That sounds reasonable. So, tell me more about your idea for the computer program they're going to write. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Okay, so it's a very simple program. I've actually written it down here so we can go through it together. Okay, so the first line says 10 CLS. What on earth does that mean? Well, every line of a basic computer program starts with a number. They usually go up in tens. So the first line is 10, the second 20, and so on. And CLS is the command we use in BASIC to clear the screen. Oh, I see. So that's just telling the computer to start with a blank screen. Exactly. Then we move on to the next line. So this one says, 20, print, guess a number between 1 and 10. Right, I see. That appears on the screen. It's not that difficult, is it, when you get the hang of it? Let's see if I can work out the next one. 30, input I. Oh, not sure about that. Well, all that's saying is that the person playing types in a number. Input is the basic command for type in, and I just means any number you like. Oh, okay. Then what happens next depends on what the number is. So we've got 40 if I is less than 1, or if I is greater than 10. Then print, bad choice. Right. So if they type, say, 0 or 11, that appears on the screen. Exactly. And then this next line takes them back to where it asks them to type in a number between 1 and 10. That's line 50. I see. And line 60 says, if I equals 6, then print. Correct. Ah, okay. So if they've typed 6, they've got it right. And if they haven't typed 6, which is the next line, then try again comes up on the screen, and that takes them back to where they choose another number. It's clever. Well done. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, Clark Cycle Hire. My name's Keith. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I saw your ad in the local paper, and as I'm thinking of doing some cycling, I'm wondering what kinds of bike you have and what your prices are like. Well, we hire out two main types of machine, touring and mountain bikes. Are you likely to be riding off-road, do you think? No, I'll probably be sticking to roads and country lanes, so a touring bike would be best, I think. Right, well, the rate will be £50 for a week or £14 per day. So it's a lot cheaper to rent by the week? Yes, definitely. Though it's important to bring the bike back on time, otherwise I'm afraid we have to charge a late return fee. And how much is that? For each additional hour, it's £1.25. So if you were a day late, it would cost another £30? Yes, that's right. I'd make sure I didn't do that then. I should also point out there's a deposit which you get back when you return the bicycle. In good condition, of course. On touring models, it's £60. Is there anything else I'd have to pay? No, that's it. Though if you're planning to ride fairly long distances, you might like to have one or two accessories. Such as? 
Well, for another five pounds, we can supply lightweight bags, either panniers or the handlebar sort. It's amazing how much they can carry. And the way they're designed means they don't get in the way when you're riding. Well, I'll see. But what about essential things like a pump and a repair kit? I wouldn't have to pay extra for those, would I? No, no, no. There's no charge for things like that. Or for a lock. It's a good strong one, too. Just make sure you don't lose the key. That reminds me. What about insurance? What happens if someone steals the bike in spite of the wonderful lock? Didn't I mention that? Oh, I, I should have told you that's included in the rental, too. And it covers everything, does it? Uh, it covers you against theft of the bike, yes. As long as it's securely locked at the time. You'd have to pay part of any individual claim, though. How much? If the bike was stolen and not recovered, you'd be liable for the first £100. Hmm, so if I do go ahead and rent one, how do I pay? By cheque or would it have to be cash? Uh, neither, I'm afraid. We can only accept credit card bookings. Otherwise, we'd have to ask our customers for the full value of the machine as a deposit. I've got a visa in my name. Would that be OK? Sure. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. So if I want to have a look at the bikes, how do I find you? I live near the university, by the way. Right. First you take Woods Road as far as the main police station. I know it. It's right next to the park. Yes, that's it. And after the police station, there's a turning to the right called Oak Street. At the big supermarket? Uh, no, it's before then. It's actually between the police station and a garage on the other side. OK. So, you go down Oak Street until you reach the health centre on the right. If you get to a pub called the Maple Leaf, you've gone too far. All right? Yes, I've got that. Now, opposite the health centre, there's a pharmacy, and we're just behind that. OK, fine. I'll try to call over sometime tomorrow. Great. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two students discussing a survey they have to write as an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. How is your market research project going, George? Very well, actually, Anna. I've just got the results of the survey back, and so now I have to draw some conclusions from the information I've collected. That's good. I'm still writing my questionnaire. In fact, I'm starting to panic, as the project deadline is in two weeks and I don't seem to be making any progress at all. What is your topic? Forms of transportation in the city. What about you? I've been finding out people's attitudes to the amount of violence on television. That's interesting. What do your results show? Well, as I said, I haven't finished writing my conclusions yet, but it seems most people think there is a problem. Unfortunately, there is no real agreement on the action that needs to be taken. 
Nearly everyone surveyed said that there was too much violence on TV. A lot of people complained that American police serials and Chinese kung fu films are particularly violent. The main objection seems to be that although a lot of people get shot, stabbed, decapitated, and so on, films never show the consequences of this violence. Although people die and get horribly injured, nobody seems to suffer or live with the injuries. Any children watching might take the heroes of these programs as role models and copy their behaviour. So, what did most people suggest should be done? A lot of people were concerned about how these films affect children. They are particularly worried that children will try to behave like the stars. The survey shows that violent programs should be broadcast after 10 p.m. when most children are already in bed. There is also a significant minority of people. Who feel that violent films should be banned altogether? Or、well, how did people feel about the violence on news broadcasts? Most of the responses I have looked at have felt that violence on news broadcasts is more acceptable as it's real. Although it's unpleasant, it is important to keep in touch with reality. Still, many people thought that it would be better to restrict violent scenes to late viewing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Your survey sounds very good. How many people filled it in? I gave out a hundred and twenty, and I got seventy back. That's a very high rate of return. Who did you give your questionnaires to? I gave a copy to every student in my hall of residence, and a few to friends from other colleges. Don't you think that this will influence your results? How do you mean? The people in your hall of residence are all about the same age. They're all students and from similar backgrounds. Therefore, it is likely that they will have similar opinions. Your results represent student opinion, not public opinion. So, how are you going to do your research? Well, I'm going to interview my respondents in the shopping mall. What I'll do is ask people if they have five minutes to spare to answer a few questions. If they agree, I will ask them some multiple choice questions and tick off their answers on my sheet. Isn't it very difficult to ask meaningful questions using multiple choice? Yes, it is. The secret to writing a successful survey is to write simple multiple choice questions that target the information you're looking for. There, it's better to write a lot of short, specific questions than longer, general ones. So that's why it is taking you so long to write. Yeah, but I hope I'll be ready to start interviewing at the weekend. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about architecture. You have thirty seconds to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-six.
During today's seminar, we will be looking at English Gothic architecture and its origins with a specific case study of Wells Cathedral in England. The Gothic style was initially brought over to England from France. This was at a period of time in which England was ruled from France by the Normans, starting with William the Conqueror, who first defeated the English army at the Battle of Hastings on October 14, 1066. After 1072, when some smaller rebellions in northern England had been defeated, the Normans gained complete control of the English monarchy, which they controlled until 1154. The peace that ensued in England had a large impact on many aspects of daily life. Thousands of French words entered the English language for the first time, such as beef, fruit, city and hour. French ideas and styles, like Gothic, also began to flow across the Channel to England too, examples of which can still be seen in the architecture of many listed buildings. A listed building is one that is protected from alteration or demolition because of its historical or stylistic importance. One such building is Wells Cathedral. Construction on Wells Cathedral began in 1175 at a time when Gothic architecture as a style was in its infancy. As a result, it is one of the first entirely Gothic buildings ever constructed. From the first designs to the date it was completed in 1490, Gothic architecture flourished in England. Therefore, later additions to the building were still influenced by this Gothic style, rather than by later architectural styles such as Tudor architecture. Older cathedrals in England would have initially been influenced by Romanesque architecture, alternatively known as Norman architecture in England. As the former name suggests, Romanesque was a building style based on the skills passed on to various areas of Europe by the Romans. When the Western Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century, these methods were retained by Rome's former colonies and developed further. One such Roman gift to the Romanesque architects was the round arch, also known as the true arch. The Romans perfected this style by using wedge-shaped stones called voussoir, which created pressure that held the structure together at the top. Cathedrals in England, such as the ones in Ely and Canterbury, were started before the arrival of Gothic architecture. Even though parts of those two cathedrals, which were constructed later, are in the Gothic style, other sections predating the arrival of Gothic architecture are Romanesque. The result is known as eclectic because the building is constructed using more than one style. All of these cathedrals belong to a group known as the Medieval Cathedrals of England. There are 26 different buildings that belong to this group in total, all of which were constructed or added to during a 500-year period from 1040 to 1540. The transition from Romanesque to Gothic began in 1144 at the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis on the edge of Paris. It was here that a Benedictine abbot by the name of Suger had just completed his plan to rebuild the Basilica of Saint-Denis in a new style through which he believed the dull mind rises to truth through that which is material. This refers to one architectural feature in particular high rib vault ceilings which created much more space inside the cathedral and were designed to draw the attention of people up towards heaven. This design feature also allowed whole walls of the cathedral to be transformed by colourful stained glass. Work started on Wells Cathedral soon afterwards, greatly inspired by Abbot Suger's work. Planned in the crucifix style with the head pointing east and foot pointing west, the cathedral is 126 metres long and the nave is 20 metres high. 
This is quite low compared to some of the bigger cathedrals elsewhere. Use of tracery, lancet windows and mullions are all characteristic of English Gothic architecture. Whilst examples of all three of these architectural elements can be found at Wells, the lancet windows have no tracery at all, which was more common in early English Gothic architecture before advances were made in the use of mullions and tracery with glass. Lancet windows are tall, thin windows with a pointed arch at the top and are so named because they resemble the weapon often carried by a soldier called a lance. Examples of these lancet windows can be seen on the west front of the cathedral, which is the most celebrated for its life-size sculptures and delicate floral carvings. Inside the pinnacle-topped gable is a sculpture of Christ the Judge. Immediately below him, sculptures of the Twelve Apostles peer out over the small city of Wells. Below the Apostles are nine archangels, which are half-size sculptures. At one time, all of these, along with the decorative carvings, would have been painted and gilded. However, today, all the paint has worn away and the sculptures are the colour of the oolite sedimentary stone used to construct the cathedral. It is remarkable to think that more than 800 years ago, such magnificent buildings were created without the use of large cranes and modern technology. It would have taken much longer but it is possible to see the high level of craftsmanship and attention to detail that is less common in the modern day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.